Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, my wonderful listeners, and welcome back to the Forty Orty Podcast. Today, I have a really amazing episode for you. I am going to be talking to someone who has had a massive impact on myself in my early advocacy days. Someone who I would consider one of the the OG autism advocates who really made an impact on autism in the world as we see it. So today our topic is 20th century versus 21st century autism advocacy and I'm going to be talking to Temple Grandin. So <laughs> with the massive time difference um, that we have, <laughs> it's taken us a few times to, um, to try and figure out um, how to get on <laughs> and chat to each other. Temple, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing just fine. I just got in from an autism talk in Canada. It was my first trip to Canada since the pandemic. Wow. Very nice uh, meeting with teachers. Um, the particular meeting was about all kinds of disabilities. So they had a display there of uh, things to help blind people to read and other really interesting things. It was a good meeting. I was there uh, yesterday. Wow. I've never actually been to the States or I've never been to Canada or any place like that. The only places that I've really traveled is um, Southeast Asia and a little bit around Europe. Oh, um, okay. Um, um, have you, are you, are you, been, are you traveling now? Because pandemic seems like it's kind of winding down. <laughs> yeah. I've been traveling normally within the U S for, yeah. for just over a year now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I think it's we're we're allowed to travel definitely at this this time. I've been to I recently had a holiday in Turkey um which was really interesting. So it was I've only really been in the summer and it was the the winter this time. So Well, how was Turkey? Um what did you do there? That sounds really interesting. Um we did a lot to be honest. Uh we we did a lot of walking <laughs> as you can imagine. There's this really amazing place called um Kaya, um, which is like this massive sort of expansive valley. And um, Turkey is, is primarily a, a Muslim country. So they have the song, the call to prayer, like every, you know, um, at the end of every day to sort of signal that they have to stop um, fasting for Ramadan. Yeah. And um, because of the valley and just how like expansive it is, it just echoes throughout the whole <laughs> throughout the whole valley and it's it's a really amazing sort of experience well i've never been to turkey but i've been to uk many times I've been all over europe uh, wow. australia south america what part of the uk did you visit well i've been to scotland london number of different um uh, meetings mm -hmm. um animal ethology animal behavior meetings uh, in the uk that's really cool. I um I live in the north the north of England, so I live in Yorkshire. Um, well, I've been to Yorkshire. Yeah, long time ago in the seventies. It's a very beautiful sort of yeah. uh, countryside and, and stuff. It's very nice. Um, so I uh, I suppose what I want to ask you is um. You know, you, you've you've had a very long sort of ex extensive career in in animal, um, in animal sciences, but you've also done a lot for, um, autism, a lot of autism. Yes. I'm doing many, work. many talks. In fact, the talk I did yesterday in Canada, right at Niagara Falls, I got to see Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. I've never seen it before. And, um, it was mainly teachers at this meeting. There was school board people there. So that was strictly an autism talk. Yeah. Now I do a lot of things on autism. And then of course I've got some of my popular books like The Autistic Brain, yes, Thinking yeah. in Pictures. Um, 
So I've, I've been doing lots of talks. I've talked to universities. Mm-hmm. I've talked to um, a lot of business groups. April's Autism Month in the U.S., big companies like S&P, IBM Computer. Wow. Um, what's been interesting when it comes to hiring people that are neurodiverse, the tech, ses- <coughs> the tech sector, the computer mm-hmm. companies, they've really reached out. They know they need that talent. And the financial sector has reached out. Um, and these are the sectors that would hire the mathematically gifted uh, people on the spectrum. Sure. Um, I can definitely say that I'm not one of those mathematically gifted autistic people. I am not either. And this brings <laughs> up another big thing I talk about. And I got a new book coming out called Visual Thinking. Mm-hmm. And um, it's about the different kinds of thinking. I'm an object visualizer. Yes. If you watch the HBO movie about me, Temple Grandin, it shows how I think visually. Mm-hmm. And I'm an extreme object visualizer. I can't do math, uh, higher math. So that makes me good at, at, at art, animals, photography, mechanics. Mm-hmm. Then you got your mathematical person that's got autism, your mathematical mind, your computer programmers, chemists, physicists. They often are good at music. And then you have the word-based person who's on the spectrum, who um, lo- loves facts about different things. You know, yeah. history is often a yeah. favorite subject. And uh, no, I made the mistake when I originally wrote Thinking in Pictures back uh, over 20 years ago of thinking everybody on the spectrum thought in pictures the way I did. That's wrong. Yes. It's a it's a subgroup that thinks in pictures. And then and then there's a then there's a group that's the more the mathematical pattern thinkers. Mm-hmm. And then they're word thinkers. That's really interesting. What what kind of um, <laughs> what kind of category would you would you put me in? Because I um, most most of the stuff that I do, is... I don't know enough about you. That's, um, that is true. <laughs> it, it tends to um, the visual thinkers like me. Um, I know a lot of them in real high end skilled trades. Sure. You know, I've worked with large companies on installing cattle handling facilities and i worked with brilliant people that were laying out entire plants on um, people that were inventing equipment and patenting it that'd be my kind of mind and some yes. of these people were on the autism spectrum undiagnosed mm-hmm. and then you've got the p- computer people working for the tech companies uh the first thing i'd ask you is what were your best subjects in school it's where i'd start <laughs> trying to figure out what kind of thinker you are uh um, it was philosophy, uh, okay. physical education, uh, chemistry, biology, and physics. Okay, now philosophy is definitely verbal. Chemistry's got a lot of math in it. Physical education that could be could be anybody. Um, a visual thinkers like me can't do algebra, and I'm sure. very very concerned that my kind of mind is getting screened out of a lot of things. Mm. Um, because real higher abstract math I can't do. But there's things that I can do that I'm very good at that the mathematicians are not mm. able to do. Yeah, it's, it seems to be a, a really big problem nowadays, uh, even, even for um, other neurodiverse people like um, ADHD or uh, dyspraxia or, or, you know, a whole, a whole host of different people. They seem to like the the education system seems to be very uh, rigid in their approach. Well, it's to, very uh, verbal oriented. Yeah. Um, because I worked with people that were designing entire big beef plants mm-hmm. and other things. I'm going to estimate about 20% of the people that I've worked with that can build anything were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And the problem is um, industry needs them. Mm -hmm. I uh, talked to a lady uh, just a couple of days ago, Gerber Baby Food Factory, and they have problems of finding people to fix equipment. We've got the same problem in the meat industry right now. The people I work with are retiring. Uh, Nobody's replacing them uh, because they took all the skilled trades things out of the schools in some of our states. Some of our states are putting it back in. And skilled trades aren't for everybody. Sure. But. How do you know if you don't try things? Mm-hmm. And often, often there's like a, a really big barrier to entry that's quite theoretical and exam. Well, I see on the things I did with cattle handling, um, there was no academic barrier to entry in that. 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's considered industrial process equipment. Mm-hmm. And if they make an academic barrier to entry on industrial process equipment, I don't care what industry you're in, you're going to be in big trouble. Sure. Because they, visual thinker like me, is the one that invents mechanically complicated equipment. Yes. In fact, if you want a poultry processing plant right now in the U.S., you're going to import all the equipment from the Netherlands, from Holland. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. They did not take out the skilled traits. That's why that equipment now, and it's mechanically clever equipment, comes from Holland. That's really interesting. That is because Hol- Holland has quite a um, um, like their 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 structure seems very different to any any other countries that I've that I've been to. Do you think there's anything particular about the Netherlands that is or, or Holland is is particular, like? Well, why they produce such such good machines? Well, right now, um, the, the Hollands, you know, um, I went to two, just before COVID hit, I went to two state-of-the-art brand new pork processing plants. Most of the equipment there came from Holland. You see, there's like two parts of engineering. There's the mathematical part, because you sure. look at a food processing plant, and I've been in tons of them. The mathematicians design the boilers, the refrigeration, power, and water requirements, make sure the building doesn't fall down. Yeah. But then all of the equipment that goes inside the plant, mechanically clever equipment, not mm. made by the mathematically inclined engineers. And this is something oh. that educators just don't uh, realize. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you look back at old patents in my new book on visual thinking, which you can pre-order right now on Amazon.com in the U.S., just put visual thinking and then my name, Temple Grandin. It's a very good book. Um, you go back at history of the patent office. Uh, in the U.S., they originally required that you submit a scale working model of your invention. Wow. Now, that's not the mathematical kind of minds. Most of the early patents were coming out of the people that were probably non-mathematicians. Yeah. I mean, think back to things like uh, printing press, uh, and that was too exactly. early to even be patented. But mechanically clever equipment. And... Uh, <coughs> We've, we've got a problem right now on people to fix factories. Yes. You can't find them. I can tell you where they're at. They're playing video games, <laughs> autism label, when they ought to be fixing factories, all types of factories. That's, re- that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of the, the work sort of advocacy in the workplace work that I've done tends to be around um, things related to the media in- industry because I know a couple of um, autistic people who um, like work for the BBC or do like their own independent um, related media stuff and um, one, of, one of the big issues that I've really found is that there's a lot of push for diversity in the workplace but yeah they, we're getting that we have that too but they, they don't tend to um, focus a lot on the inclusion aspects like the the positive reasonable adjustments so that it can get the most out of each person what i'm finding in the workplace and i've been doing a lot of workplace talks is it seems like the financial sector they can really use the mathematical type of um, autistic Mm -hmm. um and a computer sector uh, they know they need that talent yeah now you get into what i'm going to call services and consumer products and i'm not going to mention any names uh, in that situation, I it's uh, sort of more, uh, you know, they're just talking about it yeah, rather than actually <clears throat> doing something about it. And then you get the very creative sector. Yeah. Um, I visited Pixar one time. Uh, I, you can definitely see the visual thinking there, just in how the offices are decorated between so, a company like Pixar. And then you go into a, a strictly a computer company, computer guys. Oh, they might put a few geometric patterns on the wall. <laughs> but you go into Pixar, they've ripped out all the office cubicles, and one person has the Tiki Hut, and the next one has the Star Trek <laughs> cubicle. No, I'm no not way. kidding. Is, is that how no, it's... really? And it it it's you see, those are the more my kind of mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, the visual creativity. Yeah. Um, but the thing is we businesses need these different kinds of minds. And when I talk to corporations, they say, What's the first thing we have to do? The first thing is you have to realize different minds exist. Sure. 
And there's scientific research, and I've outlined it in this book, The Autistic Brain, to show that my kind of brain, the object visualizer, is different than the pattern mathematical thinker. There's scientific research that backs that up, and they have very different skills. Mm-hmm. And and I've been involved with the livestock industry for 50 years right now. I've got a plant right now that I've got a real mess of the equipment. And um, I just talked to a guy just recently who's um, pushing 70. Uh, he's going to be looking at it very, very soon to see if he can fix it. Yeah. You know, uh, for confidentiality reasons, I have to be somewhat no, course, vague about yeah. what it is. Mm-hmm. But this is a serious sense. problem. And I've talked to people in the car industry and other industries, too. It's not just a, a, a meat industry issue. It uh, goes across all kinds of factories. Wow. I, de- I definitely wasn't 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 aware of that. I mean, a lot of the statistics that I look at is is mostly around unemployment. Um, <laughs> it seems seems to be that that autistic people are really struggling to find jobs. Well, the thing I learned is the way I got jobs is I showed off a portfolio of my work. Mm. You know, the way I got jobs when I first started in the cattle industry is I basically you know show you would show people my drawings. Very nice. I would just show off my drawings. Mm-hmm. And when people, it, I would sell my work. Now, let's say your talent was in computer programming. Mm-hmm. Oh, now you'd have it on a computer rather than paper. Sure. Um, you'd show off your best paragraphs of code, neatly uh, titled to say what they're for, where someone can look at it and go, well, but. You don't show this stuff to the human resources department. You've got to show it to the engineering department, or if it's Pixar, to the art, you know, the yeah. people that make the movies department, not human resources, mm-hmm. where they look at that and they go, "Wow." So it's it's a lot about picking picking and and choosing and sort of um, f- finding a way to get around the um, the typical sort of route into into the workplace oh you have to like get around the whole interview thing that's not the way to get in now i have a slide when i talk to business people parents and stuff on how to help the person who's different i have no working memory sure so i need a checklist of what i have to do yeah me too (laughs) i need a checklist and that's a very very simple thing to do Mm -hmm. i said well can i let me just write down the steps on how to unjam the copier machine. Yeah. Let me just write down the steps. Mm-hmm. And I just heard about a guy who had worked for years uh, building fences for a fencing contractor, got a new boss and lost his job because the boss goes, blah, 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 blah. this is what we want you to build today. And he did it wrong Yeah. because yeah. he wasn't able to write it down. Uh... But long strings of verbal instruction does not work. And there's certain jobs to avoid, like super crazy busy takeout stuff where that's too much multitasking. I I definitely agree with you. Like um, one of the reasonable adjustments that I have at at my workplace, I I work for an an inclusion charity um, in the UK. And one of the reasonable adjustments that I have is um, if someone asks me to do stuff, they have to bullet point the things that they want me to do. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I do. And I I somehow figured this out. Like, let's say I'm doing a big job. We're going to remodel a, a, some, some stuff. And then I have to figure out what part of the structure we keep, what part we tear out. Um, I sort of write down exactly what they want this job to do. Budget. I'll do the designing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the railroad right-of-way measurements, you know, stuff like that. And... And I've had, you know, people talk about self-advocacy. I get specific, you know, on the thing with the checklist, I would just tell a boss, let me just write it down like a pilot's checklist. And if the yeah. boss blocks at it, I can say, you know, for pilots, checklists are not optional. They have to use it. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't even know that. Pilots I... have to use a checklist for every single flight. Wow. Is that and about... it's the law uh, in yeah. the entire world of aviation. Wow. Well, one, you know, you tell a, he said, so so just give me a couple of minutes. Like, let's go back to the guy with the fencing. All right, let me write down exactly what you want me to build. It would take two minutes at the beginning of each day to just write down 
some bullet points of what they wanted built that day. Yeah. And that that would that would be that would definitely be ideal for me. Well, yeah. that's a simple thing to do. Mm-hmm. Because I got I was uh, handling advertising for a, a, a feedlot construction company early in my career and I designed brochures wrong and the boss was annoyed about it. So I said, now let me just write down exactly what you want. And I did that. Mm-hmm. And it took maybe two minutes. Yeah. That solved a lot of problems. I also find that it actually helps a lot of other people be be more specific with what they want because, you know, pr- prior to me, you know, asking asking my coworkers to send me bullet points, um, it would just be long paragraphs of text. No, 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 no I don't want that. Um, I want it more like a pilot's yeah. checklist. Yeah. I don't want long paragraphs. Yeah. And and I, but what I found worked the best is to just talk to them verbally and say, okay, now this, 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 this. Yep. And it might be one sentence per bullet point. Yeah, yeah. And that's a very, very simple thing to do. It doesn't. It doesn't require a lot of extra work. And, and no, it's and not quite extra work. It, You're talking about. It makes about, it easier. Like, <laughs> it makes it easy for the person trying to communicate because they have to be really specific with what they want, and they have vagueness to... does not work. It's just exactly. that vagueness does yeah. not work. Exactly. And the verbal mind, I'm learning, tends to overgeneralize. Mm-hmm. They overgeneralize. Sure. Like we got to have inclusion, mm-hmm. but you don't discuss how you're going to do it. Yeah. Now, yeah. having spent years on marketing equipment to people, the other thing I found is people want the magic equipment more than they want the management to go along with that <laughs> piece of equipment. Yeah. I call it wanting the thing more than the management. Sure. But how do I sell equipment? Well, you need it. I can reduce labor requirements. I can reduce accidents. Oh, it's really big on, on insurance claims uh, figures. <laughs> you know, I'd give them, and I'm in some of these other skills that people on the spectrum have. I can tell you these factories need them. Yeah. We have Definitely. factories where people don't know how to fix things. There's two parts of engineering. There's the visual part that cannot do the math. I call it the clever engineering department. Mm-hmm. And then there's the degreed mathematician. You take a college education, degreed mathematician out on a job and just put him to supervise uh, concrete work. <laughs> I have seen some of the worst concrete work you could ever see. I can imagine. Young kid out of college getting ripped off by contractors. Been there, seen that. You see, this is where you really need the different kinds of minds. Sure. You see, also, I'm a bottom-up thinker. I think in specific examples. Mm -hmm. And then if I get enough specific examples, I start putting them into columns like on a spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. Now, I uh... need that mathematician to figure out my power requirements. Mm -hmm. You see, this is where you need to have the whole team. Mm -hmm. And you need to realize that these are complementary skills. Got the different different cogs for different... Different, different um, tasks. Well, you you need them. You need you need the different kinds of minds. That's and really I looked at a building just the other day. I normally don't do stuff. I'm building an old metal building mm-hmm. uh, where it was bolted to the concrete uh, uh, foundation. Uh, I looked at that and I said, if I try to turn those bolts, that entire connector is going <laughs> to crumble. I won't even have something to attach the new beam to. Yeah. I wouldn't even dare turn the bolts on that building. I was looking at that just the other day. I said, I am not a structural engineer, but I can tell you right now, if I turn those bolts, they may just crumble <laughs> off. And I, I don't even have anything to attach the new beams to. Sure. It'd be a real mess. Yeah. See that? Uh, I can see that. Mm-hmm. So I watched an interview video that you did with Iowa PBS called The Life Autistic. Um. Within the interview, you were talking about how work and social skills were taught in your in your generation. That's right. And how that led to less diagnosis and better life skills. Um, in modern online autism advocacy circles, there's a lot of talk around the ideas of masking yes. uh, social camouflage and discrimination. And so it seems to be developed 
or, or geared more towards developing a positive sense of self and fighting for the right to be accepted for our differences. Um, well, for example, well-being and self-advocacy seem to be more important than life skills, um, according to okay, you know the, the the talks that we generally have. So, what I really want to know is, in the frame of autism back then and autism now, what things really worked for you as an autistic person, and what areas of your life do you think you could have developed better? Well, I do not do well with social, high-speed social chit-chat talk, where three or four people get together and it it tends to have very little contact. High-speed social chit-chat talk, I can't do that. It goes too fast. Now, what they did in the 50s is there was a lot of teaching of manners, and this was not stressful. Like, um, I I watched a person on the spectrum just the other day. um, It was a shared dessert. And eat like a complete slob with it instead of taking... Uh, uh, you know, eating off one end of it carefully yeah, and, and smushed up all the ice cream in the cake where nobody else wanted to touch it. <laughs> There's no reason to do that. No. It was, it was just kind of disgusting. It was just the other day with a student. We, I, and I said, look, don't do something sloppy like that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you'd be social butterfly, but you made a mess in it. You know, or and I suggested in the future her to take a knife and cut off a portion and put it on her plate on yeah. a shared dessert. Sure. You know, but this is just see my mind thinks in specific examples. Mm-hmm. Why have such disgusting table manners that it really turns people off? There's just no reason for that. Yeah. And and it, and it's not stressful to, to learn how to do things like that. That's that's an example of of um you know fifties upbringing. Yeah. You know, you'd say, well, if you have a shared, this was cake. So you could easily like eat off one side of it and not eat what the other person had touched. Yeah. <laughs> and you see, now I'm seeing the dessert right now. I'm seeing the restaurant we were at. It's real, real recent. Yeah. Now, the other thing on masking and stress, I had horrible problems with anxiety. Horrible. Yeah. And as I went through my 20s, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And in my book, Thinking in Pictures, which is available in the UK, in all formats, um, I described my experiences with antidepressant medication. It saved me. Yeah, it stopped horrible colitis attacks. Horrible oh, health was just a mess. I'm sorry to hear about that. Yeah, absolutely a mess. And and uh, you know, so I think some of the masking thing is anxiety. Um, but on the what motivated me in my 20s is people thought I was stupid. Yeah. I wanted to prove to the world I was not stupid. Mm-hmm. And when I said, yes, I can design that dipping that project that was shown in the movie, mm-hmm. I had no idea how to do the concrete work. <laughs> I got on that phone and I found someone who could send me official engineered drawings for the concrete work. Mm-hmm. I designed the cattle part of it, the special ramp in it. I designed that. But how much rebar or reinforcement rod to put in concrete? I had no idea. No, I got an engineer drawing for that. Um, but I was I really wanted to prove to people I was not stupid. I can do it. And for me, my sense of identity is career. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of and and some of the most fun stuff I ever did was in construction. Sure. Funnest stuff we ever did. You see, that's friends who shared interests. I was bullied horribly in high school, horribly called all kinds of names like tape recorder. People don't even know what a tape recorder is now. Big thing with reels like this <laughs> I know what you that mean. you record on. And they called me that because I would keep using the same phrases. Yeah. So I'd walk across the cafeteria and go tape recorder. And it was horrible. Wow. And the only places I was not bullied was on um, um, horses. Model rockets and electronics. Mm-hmm. Okay, horses may be too expensive for a lot of people. The electronics projects were not. So, you, so um, your interests were kind of the um, the driving force. You were kind of well, yeah. But the thing is, how did I get the... interested in horses, model rockets, and electronics? I got exposed to them. Sure. A lot of kids don't get exposed to enough stuff to figure out what they might be interested in or good at. Now, yeah. the thing that I'm um, 
I'm, I'll be 75 this summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went to airport security last last night on the budget airline, and uh, this old lady doesn't really like taking her shoes off. I'm going to be so happy. After August 29th, I'll never have to take a shoe off, at least in an airport <laughs> in the U.S., ever again. So it's something I don't like, and sometimes they don't have any chairs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I look at other people that I worked with that are undiagnosed uh, autistics. Yep. They own large metal shops, big businesses, yep. ranging from a small shop to a corporate jet that I've been on. Wow. And these people, one of the one of the guys with the corporate jet, and I have to be totally vague on what he does because none of these people are declared. So sure. we had a half an hour discussion. He's in his 70s, a half an hour discussion on every label he would have been made. You name the label, he would have had it. He's my age. Juvenile delinquent, autistic, dyslexic, ADHD, horrible student. Yeah. And he started out cleaning equipment at a food factory. Now he owns a big food factory with jillions of patented devices, his patents in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see, this is, um, it's sort of like, I think one thing that concerns me is students today don't get exposed to enough different things mm-hmm. to find out. Well, would they like welding or hate it? But you wouldn't know unless you tried it. Yeah. There's, you see, there's this a lot is the of... problem. More computer programming. I think, I've seen I've... parents where they're so locked into the label, they um, they don't um, uh, they won't think to teach their kid computer programming, even though they were programmers. And mm-hmm. the kid's a genius in math, and you don't teach them computer programming, and you're computer programmers. I mean, really? So they. There's certain social things I don't do. I don't do bar scene. I don't. I, I. I can't hear in those situations. Sure. You see, I for me, I've really done a lot of thinking about identity. It's career, mm-hmm. being a scientist. Um, I've done things to improve the livestock industry. Oh, I've had thanks. parents say to me, "Well, <laughs> they read my book and." their kid went to college or their kid, you know, this it's, I am what I do. Mm -hmm. And I got into a niche of engineering where I can do engineering without uh, a math stuff. Mm -hmm. I now have found this scientific research that demonstrates there's two different kinds of parts of designing stuff. I'm it's, it's sort of like, I can't make myself social. This side effect of medication it's right okay. now. There's certain social things I don't do. Yeah. But I've gotten satisfaction in life through doing interesting things and things that I make things better. Mm-hmm. Like just telling employers and teachers about using the pilot's checklist. So sure. that's a very simple thing. They could prevent a lot of jobs from getting lost. That costs nothing. Very simple thing. You see, I don't think in, in vagueness, but then I'm looking at the student that ate this dessert in a very disgusting manner just recently. There's no excuse for that. No. I don't have to accept mushing up the ice cream and the cake all together, squashed together. Nobody else is going to want to eat it. You know, I said, you cut, you take some off with a clean spoon, put it on your plate. <laughs> I'm very carefully taking it off the other side so don't. You know, now you might say with COVID, we shouldn't be sharing a dessert. So, sure. but uh, those are huge two pieces of chocolate cake with vanilla ice cream and chocolate sauce drizzled all over. I it. could, I could do with that. And <laughs> and uh, enough there for four people. Mm-hmm. But the way she made a mess in that, why have disgusting table manners mm-hmm. be something to hold you back? Sure. That's not stressful. That I, I don't even consider that masking. And now the thing I can't do is just chit chat. Um, three people at a table. The other three are talking really fast, chit chatting. And there's kind of a rhythmic um, laughing they do. They're yeah. having such a good time. I can't follow it. They just and they then just I interrupt it, it because really. I can't. My <laughs> processor speed is too slow. To uh, yeah. yeah, I I def I definitely find find that myself. Like. Um, I, I definitely gravitate towards conversations more more one to one. I do too. Yeah. Then I do too. I was on a plane the other night 
sat next to a lady construction manager. We had a great two hour flight. Concrete forming systems, <laughs> tilt up warehouse construction, and problems with it. Yeah. That was a great flight. Conversation about something rather than a conversation for conversation's sake. Well, that's that's just it. You see, and I think some of the masking stuff is where a person's trying to do that chit chat conversation, and that would be really stressful. Sure. But you see, I think we have to look at what masking is. Eating a dessert at a, at a restaurant in a really disgusting manner in front of other people. You know, why do that? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, something that really sort of perked my ears up was um, your your experiences in in education that, or or all the workplace around around bullying and and mental health and no, stress. I had, well, do you think that there was some like what what do you think? Because um, because personally, for me, I uh, I have quite severe depression and anxiety um, that was 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 caused by. Um, the, the the bullying and isolation that I experienced at at secondary school, and the the issue was for me is that I I ha have always had even from a very young age um, a really 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 big interest in in other people, you know the the psychology of people, how people work, and how to, how to get on with them and 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 make friends, and I've I've done quite a lot of work. Um, in my time on things such as cognitive, uh, cognitive empathy, reading, reading people. And, um, I've had a lot of practice sort of out there, um, in, in group situations in at, at parties talking, um, to people that I don't know and, and chit chatting and stuff. And it's something that I've, um, developed over the years because, um, people, for me, uh, people and, and emotions are, re are a really interesting um, area for me. But, you know, g going back to what I was saying, um, you know, f for me, I gravitated towards Taekwondo okay. when I was younger. There's quite a few people on the spectrum that are good at that. That's good. Yeah. And um, my mom, my mom has always been really great. She's always introduced me to different different Good. hobbies and stuff and different you know within those hobbies yeah, you have yeah. other people that you can talk to about the things and sort of slowly build those social skills up well and um, i did a lot of things like that too and the friends who shared interests and fortunately when i was in elementary school or what you'd call primary school my third grade teacher when i was eight years old really good teacher explained to the other students that had a disability that was not visible like a wheelchair yeah and that's called peer mediated intervention. Actually, it's a fancy mm -hmm. name. And so I managed to not be bullied in elementary school, or primary school, but uh, <coughs> by the 14, 15, 16 years old, Secondary it was school. horrible. That was the High worst school. part of my life. And, and, and the only places I was not bullied was the friends who shared interests yeah. Yeah. horses, electronics, yeah. and model rockets. For another child, I had a mom tell me, oh, my kid is in the regular high school. He's in band and he's in music concert and he's loving it. And then another parent comes to me and their kid is uh, miserable and high school is horrible and yeah. he's depressed and everything else. But where things have been good or a whole lot better is when there's a lot of there's a, a shared activities they can do. Mm -hmm. it, it is a really big issue, um, bullying and uh Oh, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Like even rates of severe mental health and, and suicidality, even, even at a very young age, is um, something that, that occurs way, way too regularly. Like it's, it's always something that I, you know, in my head, I'm like, why, why aren't people talking about this, this group of people who are, um, you know, just to subject to such horrible life experiences very commonly and, and, you know, developing these, these mental health conditions. As a well, no, it's, it's completely terrible. And the thing that saved me is even in a career. Mm -hmm. Okay. To sit around the shop, the whole, there's two things you do. You talk about in the shop, how to build stuff and how stupid suits are. <laughs> now I have the managers, but yeah. I have since learned, and I didn't know that when I was sitting around in a job trailer, you know, discussing this kind of stuff, uh, shared interests. I didn't realize that the well, we, people we were calling suits, the managers were verbal thinkers. 
And the way they think is totally different. They overgeneralize. And they don't, um, uh, they'll make decisions or they don't have enough detail to make a decision. But you also see, need the verbal mind to organize things because these successful people that where they grew their welding expertise into a big business, they have to hire some suits. Mm-hmm. Uh, just And they do normally. And now that I know more about how people think, I'm finding this very, very interesting. And then you get the right leader in there. They can really, really work together. Um, but so, the thing that saved me was friends who shared interests. Same thing at work. You know, we would um, talk about animal behavior research, stuff like that. That's making up new studies to do in animal behavior. Like I did study 25 years ago. My student did it. I thought it up. And I said, well, I think cattle that jump all around when you handle them are going to have lower weight gain. <laughs> People thought it was crazy. Well, that's been replicated a whole bunch of times now. Yeah. But you see that that again is career related and and um, where I, I've had, you know, this is a book, Different Not Less. This is mm-hmm. 18 people in the U.S. Well, actually, it's one from the U.K. Actually, it was a veterinarian where getting diagnosed later in life gave them insight into their relationships, mm. you know, and why they weren't getting along. Mm. And I edited this book. They wrote in their own words. I learned a lot from this too, about how I think differently. It's uh, my main emotion is fear. Okay, uh, I'm okay. Yesterday, for example, okay, went to Canada and I've been out of the country for two and a half years. Sure. Now I'm not going to say I freaked out as we approached customs, but I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I'm going on. Highly stressful. It's going to be just fine, you know. It's <laughs> it's um, I'm. Fear is my main emotion. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's like an emotional complexity that most people have that I don't have. Mm-hmm. So and it's kind of it it kind of sounds like um because I I do a lot I've done a lot of uh, reading into a concept called alexithymia, um, which I think is, is I don't know what that is. Could you tell me what it is? Sure. Um it's the ability to to recognize and categorize your own emotions and it's it's something that is very very highly um correlated with autism and you know one i kind of like to describe it as sort of like a threshold condition so it's um so if you for, for example if you have a threshold of of anxiety from 0 to 100 a um, hundred being complete meltdown, complete can't oh, do yeah. anything. Well, that... yeah. um, and most most people, their their threshold for noticing when the anxiety sort of increases would be like maybe 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, whereas for autistic people, our threshold is a lot higher. So it takes, you know, it takes a lot a lot more time for us to notice um or a lot more st- strong emotions to notice them. And, you know, that, that you know, you think. Well, the about, other thing uh, I find can... a lot of my problems is that a lot of problems I have, I don't have any processor. So the other day, the stupid parking gate didn't work at the airport. And this car I got, has got proximity sensors. Then I take the seatbelt off to try to reach the thing, the stick, the credit <laughs> card that in it that didn't work. So now I get the seatbelt thing going off, proximity se- sensor going off, couldn't get the machine to work. Mm-hmm. And, and that kind of stuff, um, you know, it, it loads my processor. Yeah. I like to use a computer analogy. I'm an Intel 286, but I got the cloud warehouses full of servers for memory. Mm-hmm. And you see it, just all those going ding, 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 and it's making some other noise. And <laughs> I couldn't reach the machine. And, and then if I get closer to it, then the proximity sensor made another alarm. I feel and, your pain. And that kind of stuff if I'm tired I'm so I go to the gate with the attendant Mm -hmm. but the attendant gate wasn't open that night so I just want to avoid that problem so I just if I go to the gate that's got the person in it yeah yeah I mean um you know the the whole the whole thing about uh, Alexa Fimea is that it's you know it's it kind of goes off the basis that you you do you feel those those background complex 
that like you experience those complex background emotions in your behavior. See, I don't, see the thing is, I don't think I have complex emotions. I get scary easily, but then there's things where I used to be afraid of airplanes, terrified. Yeah. Well, you know how I got over that? You make them interesting. Yeah. You just make them really interesting. I got the ride in the cockpit back in the 70s, a big airplane hauling heifers. Mm-hmm. That was really interesting. I'm, I'm not afraid of airplanes anymore. Mm-hmm. It, it's sort of like you learn more about COVID. What I did with COVID is I read all these scientific articles about COVID. Okay, there's all this controversy about medications. I won't discuss them because it's yep. too controversial. Yep. But let's put it this way. I went deep into the scientific literature and I was pretty sure if I got COVID, I could save my butt. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. And having that knowledge reduced the fear. Mm. So it's sort of it, having the knowledge reduced the fear. So sort of and I'm, the unpredictable. I am a scientist. I was going very deep into the literature, scientific literature, way further than 99.9% of doctors believe. Sure. <laughs> I spent well, it, hours the, the, online, the hours online aren't they, on so. scientific databases doing that. Yeah. Uh, that's how I dealt with my fear. Mm-hmm. Now I can also be really happy. And I've learned I got when I was a teenager, I got in trouble for anger. So I had to switch anger to crying. Yep. So then when I get in some situation that's upset and cry, because you don't get in trouble for crying, you sure. get in trouble for hitting. Yeah. So you have to, you know, get rid of that. Mm-hmm. And I can be sad. And I can tell you the things that make me sad. I have to give you a specific example. I read about a scientist in the Ukraine who was studying whale fossils. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't take his fossils with him. And so he photographed everything. And he had a single portable hard drive. It's not like I think about the size of this book. Yeah. With his life work on it. And that's such a fragile thing. It could break so easily. His whole life's work was in a hard drive. Little hard drive box and i start to get upset just talking about that yeah he was doing everything he could to save his life's work trying to download it to france over slow internet connections i'm going then finally went on a train with it and i'm going what would i do with that hard drive it'd be right here under my shirt tucked in with a jacket over it yeah i'm i wouldn't even have it in a bag yeah and the cords would be under the, my shirt too you see, but preserving his life's work. I can't even talk about that without yeah. getting upset. I can't even look at a hard drive now without <laughs> a portable hard drive, perhaps now without getting upset because I think about that. And this gets back to what identity is. This scientist's identity was what was in that hard drive box. And he wanted to get it safely downloaded somewhere else. You could sure. drop it in a puddle. He's a visual thinker, and that's the end of his life's work. I, 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 see, I get, feel that I as get well. upset about that. <laughs> you see, and that's um, I'm, I'm not saying that the, that the path I've taken is a path that everybody should do, but having interesting career, interesting stuff to do. I had to have a COVID project, so I worked on this book on visual thinking. I went deep into scientific literature on that because I had to have stuff to do. Yeah. Um, and then the knowledge I had of medical stuff. Um, well, now I'm quadruple vaccinated and I'm not worried about it now. Good. Autism awareness, understanding, and societal adjustments from the general public um, have improved um, yeah. since since your childhood, adolescence, and, and young adulthood. Um, diversity. Oh social media and inclusion are all really hot topics nowadays. Yeah, they are. And that's sure to raise the the public understanding of autism. What I want to ask is, what was the world like for you back then? And what positives or negatives have you seen in terms of societal adaptations for autistic people? Well, you see, what I think has happened in my generation is the Asperger types, I know that they officially don't use it, where there was socially awkward, no speech delay. Sure. Those people went ahead and got decent careers, learned how to work at an early age, but their relationships and marriages were, were very problematic. Sure. And they didn't have any idea why. Then the kids like me, severe speech delay. When I was three, I was a complete mess. I'm like, I was the kind of kid they would just throw away in an institution in the 50s. 
but fortunately I was very Sounds lucky too. to get into a very good early speech program that two teachers taught in the basement of their home. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, the fifties upbringing was helpful. Kids played outside and did all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had a good childhood. Teenage life was terrible. Yeah. Um, and see, this is the problem you got with autism. You're going to Elon Musk, who has publicly announced it, sure. to somebody who can't dress themselves, and you got the same name for it. Yeah. That's, I, I, I think, I, a I problem. Agree with you. I agree. I think it's a big problem because they got very different needs. Mm-hmm. You know, we also have some individuals with an autism label where, where they got very severe epilepsy and other problems. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to be doing engineering or art or photography or something mm-hmm. like that. But some of those individuals can type independently. Yeah. And they have a good brain inside there. And we need to be, I always, all my formal presentations talk about the ones who can type independently, like Tito Makapate, Carly, and then, of course, Noki, the Japanese boy. I always talk about that and how we need to be, you know, giving them that opportunity. They can do that. But um, I'm I, when I talk to businesses, I, this comes from a background of being in business. I didn't just sell cattle handling facilities based on being nice to cattle. Yes, I brought that up. I told them how they'd make money if they had my equipment. That's yeah. how I sold equipment. Yeah. And then right now I'm saying, you need this visual thinker who can't do algebra because mm-hmm. your factory's going to fall apart otherwise. Mm-hmm. You need a, you need people like me who cannot do algebra. Your factory's not going to run. How about things like wastewater treatment, mm-hmm. the power plant? Yeah, you need the mathematicians for the power load, but you also need people like me to keep the plant running. Sure. I mean, I want I got to make sure the suits that are in charge know that. <laughs> I love See, that you call them suits. This is sort of how I push things. We need. We really do need all the different kinds of minds. Yeah. And and the other thing that I that I think is important is not talking about vaguely. Let's talk about accommodations in the workplace that are easy. The pilot's checklist. Sure. Don't be vague. Um, maybe some sensory breaks. Mm-hmm. Keeping out of the jobs with the crazy multitasking. Sure. These are simple things. And where I've seen a lot of problems in the workplace is when the boss changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's been that's often problematic. So I suppose that they're your key uh, authority figure in this in this in in the workplace. And if you have a good relationship with them and they get you and they they make adjustments for you, you you have some. But you other see, and I think see we're talking about making world. adjustments in a very vague way. <laughs> Sure. Okay. Where the, I'm going to be very specific about the pilot's checklist and the bullet points, mm-hmm. because I can think of like 10 examples where if they'd done that, the jobs wouldn't have been lost. And it's sure. a very specific, very simple accommodation. And I think it's hard for the verbal thinker to understand that maybe I can't remember a 10 steps they want me to do. Mm-hmm. I've got to write them down. You see, and then you get into other disabilities. I, I'm, I'm, where a blind person that should have been hired for a call center job, customer service job, didn't get the job. See, my mind doesn't think in in in, in generalities. Sure, and, I understand. I... And I think the problem with the guy is the H. He was interviewing with HR, and I think they just take one look at the guide dog and go, "Oh, the accommodation is going to be too hard." <sighs> you see, I think a better approach would be, "Okay, you see my dog? You're freaking out right now." Why don't I give you a two-week free trial? I only need one accommodation, yeah. the special software, and it won't wreck your computer system. It's got this security and that security. And my friend will come in with me for an entire week so we can learn the office. Sure. If I had been approached that way, he got turned out like 10 jobs. It was awful. Really Jesus. articulate blind guy. That was terrible. But tell the employer how the accommodation is easy. And mm-hmm. what it is, special, there's only one thing that corporation had to provide, and that was the special software. He had his everything else he would provide. Sure. His favorite keyboards, headphones, just all his other stuff he'd provide. And there might have to be some adjustment made on jacks. And no, my stuff's not going to wreck your computer system. 
So, yeah, but I'm approaching talk, it more from an engineering approach, like how <laughs> I I thought it was disgusting that he was turned down from ten jobs. Yeah, it's it's apparent. Totally disgusting. It is apparent. I, um, I, mean, like, I, I, was, I I was wondering, you know, outside of the workplace, you know, talking about, um, you know, the 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 statistics that we've talked about. Do you think that there are any like can you can you see any way forward in improving like the the the, the overall life quality of autistic people okay like now let's get more specific social isolation let's get more specific um now one problem i'm seeing on the job front is i see parents get so overprotective the child's never gone shopping and he's a teenager fully verbal teenager never gone shopping mm. Learning to drive, that's going to take a whole lot longer, a whole lot longer. I just talked to a guy yesterday at the conference, and um, I said, I want you to start out in a totally safe place where there's nothing to hit, giant parking lot with no light posts. It's going to take a lot longer Mm -hmm. to deal with the multitasking issues. Sure. But it's... um, uh, and then another issue for women is getting into abusive relationships. That's a big problem. Yeah. That's a very, very big problem. Yeah. You know, and I basically, um, okay, I'm not saying the path I've chosen is the right path, but I'm celibate and I put everything into work. So sure. now I'm not saying that's a path for everybody, but that's the path I took. Mm-hmm. I, um, I do a lot of work around uh, socializing and relationships in my in my online work and um i do i do agree with you like there is a lot of there's a lot of abuse when when autistic people um date neurotypical people because we don't we don't have that sort of um inherent sense um for people you know some sometimes we 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 put too much weight on people's words rather than their actions and um you know what 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 they say to us you know if they say right okay this is not how it is this is this is how it is and it it could be something completely different and um one thing that i have noticed in um particularly in in my relationships that i'm very vulnerable to people who don't have the best intentions who don't have the the most healthy um healthy sort of view of relationships you know um, and there's a lot of infantilizing that goes along, you know, like being treated like you're a child because you have a different communication style. You well, know. I've seen that too. Yeah. And one of the things that motivated me is whole thing about proving it wasn't stupid. Yeah. That yeah. was such a big mm-hmm. motivator. Yeah. I can do it. I am not stupid. Mm-hmm. You know, even now it's sort of like, okay, I may be pushing 75, but I can still think up good research ideas and I'm I sure can still could. do things, even though I can't walk as fast now as I used to be able to. So, so, um, but it's, it's, uh, but I'm seeing situations where a kid, fully verbal kids overprotected and not learning shopping, not learning bank account. I mean, just basic stuff. The moms get very, very overprotective. So. Sure. And then I heard when they get him in the right job, like something like office supply store, where it's not too much multitasking, I'll hear things like he blossomed, he yeah. bloomed. Mm-hmm. I've heard that over and over and over again. So, you, so you're you're saying that you know the um, it's important to learn these these life skills as as a, absolutely, as a priority, absolutely, priority. absolutely, and. And I would avoid the jobs uh, like crazy takeout window at McDonald's. I'd avoid that job. <laughs> and um, for your kind of mind that's verbal, a really good kind of job is specialized retail. All so, right. Let's say you worked in the office supply shop. You would know every printer in there and help people pick out the right printer for them, not try to just shove the whole store down their throat. So, and people appreciate that. Specialized retail, selling phones, and you know every phone that's in there and exactly what it does. Mm-hmm. What would you say about more more um, complex jobs like um, 
well, not not more complex, but different jobs like uh, presenting, like like what I do with my podcast, or well, yes, uh, then that's um that you can be good at that, and again, that's something that's specific. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're doing podcasts, you've got a certain audience that you go to, that's something specific. Yes, you can be good at that. Mm-hmm. There's no multitasking, there's no load on working memory. That is true. Yeah, you see, the things to avoid is the stuff that loads that small processor. Yeah. You see, all the things that are doing design work, there's no working memory issues with that. Mm-hmm. If a guy's programming, working for you know one of the tech companies, uh, that's all pulled off a of long-term memory. There's no, there's no multitasking issue. Doing writing programs. Sure. Can I and, can I ask you another question? Yep. Yeah. Um. So pers- personally, I've I've followed your work for for a long time. I've read your books. Um. You know, as I said, I think you're, you know, one one of the autism advocates that you know role models. I would say. They really made a, da- a, a a marked difference on myself and well, indeed, good. And how did I help you? Okay, I might ask you a question. How did how did I help you out? I think it was. Um, I think it gave me, you gave me a lot of inspiration that I can approach life in my in my own unique way. Um, it, you also gave me a lot of. Um, you know it. I I think that you know I I was diagnosed when I was ten, and okay, it was only older. until my my twenties that I started to really read into what autism was, and I your your books really um, gave me a, a great insight into into my own brain. You know, s- some things didn't apply to me, but yeah. a lot of a lot of the things re- really did, and it gave me a, a great basis for sort of. Um, understanding who I was. Um, well, I got I, a lot of insight from reading other first person lived in accounts. <coughs> that helped me very, very sure. much. So, sure. and also some of the scientific research. You know, where some of the social circuits aren't hooked up. I got mm-hmm. insight from that mm-hmm. too. And <coughs> what I what I wanted to to ask is, you know, like. In in modern days, a lot of the the advocacy work that I see um, seems seems to go on a lot in in social media. Seems to go a lot in in podcasts and, and radios and sort of digestible yeah. digestible content. And um, what what I want to know is how has your approach to advocacy and autism education changed from back then? Uh, to the modern day, do, do you find that there's anything that you struggled to adapt to, or is it? Well, I've been. I'm not big on. I don't do social media that much. Um, uh, one thing that worries me about it is there's so much quick reactions. I've read yeah, some of the yeah. research on it. Yeah. Is is okay? You read something on social media. You write something, and then we push send, and it's instantly all over there without yeah. time to think. It, a lot of the there's a lot of nasty stuff, and it comes from making a reaction extremely quickly without thinking about it. Now let's just look about uh, false things on social media, and it's very controversial. So I'm going to pick out uh, something really stupid that uh, you know airplanes leave you know trails in the sky. Yeah, it can and they're trails. government plot. All right, <laughs> I think I can safely talk about that. Yeah, you can. I actually talked to one person who actually believed that, oh, um, and and. If you, let's say you, there's been experiments done where they force people to look at stuff, but they can't push send right away yeah. or share right away, yeah. or they have to think about it, then they're better at figuring out, well, that really is garbage. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to share that. Sure. But I think the problem is, is it is this quick emotional reaction. Mm-hmm. When Facebook was first invented, I don't know. I did a talk at Kansas State University to a bunch of cattle uh, cattle ranchers. And I said, social media magnifies the voices of extremes on both yeah. sides of any issue. Yeah. Any issue. Yeah. And I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to give you examples that are controversial. But it may, but it's because you get that quick emotional reaction without actually negative. engaging thinking. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. I I I definitely empathize with you on that because um I, one of the issues that I find particularly tr- trying to grow my 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 brand my, me as a person, me as a speaker, me as a, Okay, yeah. um mentor etc is the 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 main issue is that I pr- I think very very slowly but I, I think do, yeah. I think very complex as yeah. well. Um so my my brain is more suited to that longer form sort of con content like the the it's not snippets of 60 seconds or 15 yeah. seconds that I yeah. that I release that I'm good at um it's the the long the long sort of stuff that's that's developed. well that's kind of the way I am too I'm a slow processor mm-hmm. and and you get people writing stuff that um I it's all based on a on a quick emotional response Sure. Without thought, you know, this is the thing that's a concern. Mm-hmm. And I look at so many things and, and uh, I'm going, well, they're not, nobody's thinking about any of this stuff. <laughs> How do you solve problems? Okay. I mean, I work with uh, real things in, in designing facilities, animal behavior problems. They got a problem with a dog or something like that. Yeah. I find that first of all, the verbal thing overgeneralized. They'll say something like, my dog is crazy. Well, I don't know what it did. Crazy, happy, jumping on you, little white fluffy dog or big <laughs> huge dog and it's biting you. Yeah. Um, I have. I don't have enough information. This is something verbal thinkers do all the time. Whether it's an animal behavior problem or a people behavior problem, I, I don't have enough information to give a reasonable answer to my dog is crazy. Yeah. I don't have enough information to even begin to answer that. Yeah. I uh, is it is it was it happy crazy uh, <laughs> uh angry biting crazy? Yeah. Scared crazy? It's the vagueness. It's too vague. And I find the same thing people come to me on talking about their kids. Well, first thing I need to know is age. Are we doing early intervention age, primary school, high school, adulthood? Yeah. I don't I don't want to be talking about something in high school or secondary school. And the parent has a three-year-old. <laughs> uh, that, that's not enough information. So, sure. see the things that I guess for me is my view of acceptance. I I uh, I'm accept and I'm respected for what I do in my work. Yes, definitely. I'm good at my work. Um. I don't do the party scene unless it's a party associated with an autism group or (laughs) livestock group or some other convention party. And then I tend to talk to just single people and migrate around the room. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I realize there's things in my life that other people do. Like I listen to songs on the radio and I started uh, calculating how much of those about relationships and love. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like over half of all the songs. It's true, isn't it? It it gets yeah. on my nerves. But I don't care. I like 60s music. I don't care if I listen to the 60s station, listen to country western, listen to the 70s. I get Sirius XM, 70s station. And I've got to thinking about that relatively recently, actually, that the vast number of songs is about relationships. Mm-hmm. Now there's some songs about work. I actually like those songs better. Um, or abstract ideas, or you know. Or, but it's there. I realize that there's a part of life that I don't experience, mm-hmm. and I've replaced intellectual complexity for emotional complexity. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Sure. Intellectual complexity for emotional complexity because I'm emotionally real simple. Mm-hmm. Get scared easily. I get uh, have a can't blow my task. Mm-hmm. Well, I try to avoid those situations. Sure. And what I'm what, what what I maybe what you need to inform me on is because some advocates don't like me. Is what are those advocates wanting out of life? Now, obviously, not to be discriminated at work and things like that. Obviously, yeah. but I think they're. Kind of 
what they want different than them from me. I think it's um, I, I I would agree with you, and that's 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 why I asked a, a question earlier about the, you know, how how autism advocacy has changed, and it seems to be seems to me um, that it's a lot about specifics of of language use um, that is the the gateway um, <laughs> to people either liking or, or disliking you in the in the autistic community, like. For example, my 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 name on YouTube and my name on Instagram is currently Asperger's Growth. Now, Asperger's well, I can agree with that because just in my own case, I keep learning more and more. I have had people say to me, "The older I get, the less autistic I I act," <laughs> and that my talks have gotten better as I got older. So that would be Asperger Growth. Yeah, and you know it it makes sense, doesn't it? And and the the message is clear, um, but a a large chunk of the amount of comments or messages or emails that I get, it's about my name. It's about my choice of name rather than what I do, you know. And oh, it's really it's really depressing sometimes. Really that, that... language based, you see, because I'm see as I'm an object visualizer. It, mm -hmm. You see, because there's there's three kinds of um. You know, people on the spectrum. There's object visualizers. Yep. There's the pattern math and music, <clears throat> and then they're the ones that are history lovers, where they are word based. So, sure. which I'm definitely not. Mm -hmm. And and so they really get into the exact language. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, what language should I avoid using? What language should I use? What are the rules? Tell me, I'll do it. Well, I, I can send you my, my videos on Autism Language Explained, if you'd like to well, see Why don't those. you just explain it in a very, <laughs> maybe explain, me. give me the elevator speech. Yeah. Yeah, give me the elevator speech right now. Okay. Um, people don't like Asperger's. Um, they're, they're moving away from the term Aspie. Got that. I knew that because, mm. because of the bad background of the doctor. That sure. I knew about. Sure. Um. We're also moving away from, um, we're, we're uh, moving more towards neurodiversity related language. So uh, neurodivergent is the name that people, that, that people have given to people who are neurodiverse. So like, well, ADHD, and I, and I can, and I, I understand that because you get autism in the, well, fully verbal forms. It is a, it would just be a personality variant. Um, that that I can I can go along with that. I'll use those terms. Uh, now, one thing I got bashed about was uh, using high and low functioning. Yeah. Now I can't change old stuff as in older books, mm -hmm. but now I in everything new I'm calling it. Okay, once I get past age six or something like that, fully verbal, partially verbal, nonverbal. Yeah. Uh, that those are the words I'm using now but I can't do anything about the older publications. You can't go so, back and change a book. No, exactly. Um, but I, now sometimes I still got some stuff where I have to use those terms. And um, because if I don't use them, then the people don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. So I'll say, exactly. well, talk about Asperger's. I'll just say um, they don't use that term anymore, but that's um, socially awkward, no speech delay. Yeah. <laughs> in a, in a nutshell, for for sort of explaining what autism is to to other people, it's you know even to explaining to other people, but also in medical settings, in social care settings, in teaching, you know, some it's important to have to have some kind of language that distinguishes people, um, not because we want to. Uh, hate on a certain group or we want to be more superior or you know that that's the kind of stuff that people say but to actually explain what explain what groups of people we're talking about um and i i don't use high functioning and low functioning well i'm i i have stopped using it i'm calling it no, uh, mm. fully verbal, partially verbal, non-verbal. And when I'm that's talking about idea. auditory language coming out of the person's mouth, that's how it, I would find. Uh, but what I find those crazy. are the terms I'm using now. 
Uh, and then also on my talks, making it very clear about some of the nonverbals that can't control their movements. They look really severe. Uh, the books written by people who type independently. Sure. And when I do a full autism talk, that's in all my slideshows. I make sure. sure people know about those books. And the, the crazy, the crazy thing is about about this whole thing is that people are people would be a lot more likely to accept what what you say if you say it in those terms if you use that language. But you're basically saying the same thing. Well, it's that's just, right. <laughs> it is it is the same thing. I mean, it and it, and there's a lot of other controversial stuff, you know, where you're changing some of the language. And I can think of words I said I'm not going to repeat because they're too controversial that, you know, I said as a young child that sure. everybody did. I didn't sure. Sure. even think that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know. But the thing that that um, I, I want to see, I'm finding the people on the spectrum that are happiest have got jobs they really like. Yeah. So one of my big things is um, helping adults make the transition to work and I one see. of the big problems i'm seeing is this kid's so overprotected he's never gone in the store and bought something by himself <laughs> and he's fully verbal like you gotta be kidding so i have to talk about shopping yeah but it, it's um i also think about and i've done a lot of stuff about identity is when you look at a lot of last names of people they are jobs smith yeah. baker Minor, yeah. Mason, these are jobs. So what that tells me is that a lot of people's idea of um, their identity was um, tied up in their work because their last names were names of jobs. That's really interesting. And and you really all I can say about the English language, well, I've done it in any other language no, other sure. than English. And so what I'm thinking is. For me, my sense of identity is not the autism is important as to who I am, but it's secondary to sure. a scientist, designer, inventor, sure. and you, animal you, behavior. You have specialist. your own. You have the the own right to choose that. Whether you want to say, for example, uh, what kind of language you want to use, whether you want to use person first or identity first language, I think it should be something that the individual chooses. Well, I would agree with that. You see, one in my very earliest publications, okay, and here this book came out 10 years ago. I call it the autistic brain. Yeah. And I didn't even think about <laughs> what kind of language it was. Then I had educators. It was educators who were pushing person first. You should say person with autism. So I started doing that. <laughs> and then I found out the activists want identity first. So then I put autistic in there. Then I get questions from educators. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you using person first? And then I just explain that a lot of activists don't like person first. Yeah. I yeah. just explain it. So sometimes I use a mixture because in writing, it's not good to just keep saying something the same way all the time. Don't you think, don't you think it would be a lot more straightforward and a lot more easier if the focus was not on language for, for most things and it was on the actual issues that autistic people have. Well, I'm interested in the actual issues. And yeah. the other thing is, you got to remember, I've spent years in construction sure. where I would sell a job, design it, supervise the construction, start it up and make it work. So construction is all about finishing projects. So if this yeah. kid just ends up in the basement playing video games when he should be out building things. Sure. I don't consider that very good. No. And, and then I... I go back and forth between the educational world and the industrial world. I was just out in a factory that was a big mess, and I can't go into the details, but um, we're going to pull a guy out of retirement. He's practically retired to fix it. Cool. And I tell educators about that. In other words, I'm going back and forth between these, these, uh, these two worlds. And so I want to discuss uh, health insurance is a huge issue in the U.S. Yeah. Let's talk about real stuff. Then how do we fix it? People say, well, how, how come you were successful in improving things in the cattle industry? Well, I didn't just go, the cattle industry is a big mess. I picked out something specific, cattle handling. That's specific. Yeah. Or for the person, uh, health insurance. Sure. Um, you see, one of the big problems we've got, the way we're set up, is if the person loses their disability payment, they also lose the health insurance. 
Well, there's a lot of them in the U.S. If they could keep the health insurance, they could give up the disability payment. That's really interesting. But that's a real serious problem. It's been a serious mm. problem in my country for years. Oh, you don't know how lucky you are to have your health service. <laughs> um, they, they, uh, you know, certain things were free, like COVID vaccines were sure. were free. Um, but you get a real serious health problem. Right now, the price of insulin is a gigantic ripoff. Jesus. Um, but that's a very big issue. Um, it's like... Um... Because uh, a lot of a lot of my work is centered around um, it's either either theory relationships or uh, quality of life. So oh, I'm certainly I, interested in quality of life. I focus on the the mental health issues, the well, I, the workplace issues, the my workplace issues, issues. You know, but the biggest problem is one one basic principle: you need a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. Let's start out with chores for little kids. Let's replace the paper routes, which don't exist anymore, with volunteer jobs where somebody outside the home is a boss. Real jobs are instant. They're legal. So they learn how to work before they graduate from high school. Sure. That's really important. So they aren't just suddenly graduating maybe with an advanced degree and they've never worked. A sure. gradual transition. But there's a tendency for a lot of parents to just over baby and i'll say now have you gotten a, your son a job yet and they said we're thinking about it i said we've got to do it who do you know that owns a <laughs> shop let's just get them in the back door sure you know this is where i'm with the with the fully verbal end of the spectrum we're really, really seeing problems mm -hmm. so that's a big thing that i advocate for theory i don't mm -hmm. i'm not theory picture thinkers are not theoretical that's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad that we we see see eye to eye on <laughs> the kind well, of well. Yeah, that we, I want people to get jobs. I want people because I think about the people I worked with professionally that were designing equipment, inventing equipment, building things. Um, I think they have pretty happy lives. Sure. In fact, one of them that was on the spectrum uh, about ten years ago, he got into a real nasty plant manager. Mm -hmm. And he called me. He says, "What do I do about that?" I said, "The guy's a jerk. Take your, pull your equipment out, send him a bill. Sure. Concentrate on your good clients. When he gets fired, then you go back to that plant." Sure. So I told him, "You see, and I've been around for enough years that I had to learn these things. Sure. I also had to learn in a very uh, real rude kind of way that you could have someone in charge of a project with a gigantic ego." <laughs> that would do things wrong, really wrong. I'm talking multi-million dollar mistakes. Yeah. Because they wouldn't listen to their engineering staff, for example. Oh, we don't have enough wastewater treatment yeah, for this plant expansion. They went ahead and did it and it was shut down. Well, it's, you, see, what kind of blows my mind is how irrational so-called normal people can be. <laughs> you built something where you didn't have enough wastewater treatment. And all your experts told you not to do it. Char charisma. That happened on a project 20 years ago. But boy, this guy came out of sales. Boy, did he know how to talk. I, I was just going to say, like, charisma yep. and an ego, it, it gets you a long way in the well, workplace. I, can tell him, <laughs> I call them the plant wreckers. Yeah. When it comes to, uh, no, the, the project failed. Yeah. Multi-million dollar failure. Jesus. You know, that, and I, my cattle stuff worked, but the whole place closed. But that's something, as a person on the spectrum, was like a rude awakening yeah. to learn that ego could get so big that it would wreck a job. Yeah. Actually wreck it, make the project fail. Yeah. And really then being a woman, for me, was a much bigger barrier than autism ever was. Much I can bigger. I can I can definitely imagine that like much was... much bigger barrier. Yeah. But I don't get into you know you start thinking about what's the meaning of life. I used to look for all kinds of stuff. I finally figured out if the things I do help make something better. Like when a parent says, "My kid got a job because of one of your books," or "My kid went to college and he's doing just great," 
because I read one of my books or heard one of my talks, then I'm doing, I, I like those real kind of results. Sure. And, and I know there's some people that you see, then you get into the masking issue. Yeah. This stuff. So what I'm talking about, the the thing about the dessert being eaten in a sloppy manner, that's business social. That's not even stressful to do that. Yeah. Just don't be a slob with other people at a restaurant. Just don't. Yeah. That's not hard. Now, the thing that takes huge strain is trying to listen to these fast moving, very social conversations at the restaurant that I cannot do. So. And now as older, I've got one partially deaf ear, so it doesn't help either. No. And and being someplace where there's you're putting too much load on that working memory can be very, very, very stressful. Sure. You know, it's sort of like I kind of divide the social into business social. Shake hands, do it. It's not hard. Yeah. Yeah. But to be, I'm finding where you have a cocktail party where I'm supposed to just greet a whole bunch of people. Chit chat, yeah, that can start to get old. Yeah, but um, I just find it boring. I find it boring too. I agree. I find it very boring. <laughs> I can do it. It's I can just, do it, I, and it's not. But some people, you see, some people say that that the reason why I have so much anxiety was because of masking. No, it's not. It was total biology. Yeah, my nervous system, my fear center was three times larger. That's been confirmed. Brain scan. Sure. No, I went on the low dose of the antidepressant drug. It made all the difference in the world. I'm really glad. I'm 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 on antidepressants as well. <laughs> I'm on an ancient old one, and the mistake mm. that's often made is too high a dose. Is that a tricyclic? Yeah, I'm on an old tricyclic. You see, the Prozac type drugs weren't invented when I went sure. on it. So I'm on an old tr- ancient tricyclic that I now am going through. Uh, a third generic company making it. I hope they don't stop making it. Sure. Well, I, I'm but, on an SSRI. It's, uh, yeah, called, and, and, and those are really good medications. And the mistake that gets made is the low dose will work, and then they raise it, and then you get agitation, and, and you cannot sleep. Exactly. It's and the that's anxiety. a mess. The anxiety just... Uh, it's... No, you see, there's a dose window. Even though this book now is 25 years old, the information in there on the medication is still accurate. Yep. And and it wasn't masking that caused that anxiety. It was uh, biology. Sure, sure. But it's, it's um, you know, I want to just see people on the spectrum have fulfilling lives, be everything that they can be. Um, in my country, healthcare is a major issue. You know, you get, see, they get on disability. See, in my country, if you get on disability, you get free health care. Sure. And if you go off the disability, you lose a health care coverage. I had I had another question, but. Okay, I, all right. I, I don't want to, um, I, 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 I realize that you're a very busy person and I don't want to, to drag it well, on. Well, I'm glad to had a chance to talk to you because I know there's some advocates that don't like me. And I think that they're going to find that our think my goals aren't that different except sure. i just put a lot more emphasis on career sure. and the people that i find that are happy have got good careers but then sometimes their marriages are a mess and that's where this different not less book came in sure. which i edited and this is written in the lived in their own words i'm basically the editor of this book if it, if it helps uh put your put your mind at peace um <laughs> A lot of the the people who are very aggressive in not liking people because of certain small things that you say or do, those people are usually the loudest. And oh yeah, there is so many people who, you know, they'll, they'll listen to our podcast episode and they'll get so much value out of it, and they'll they'll really see what you what you're trying to do and and what you're saying. Well, as I said before, when I went to gave that talk at the cattle the cattleman's meeting at Kansas State University when Facebook was invented, I said social media magnifies the voices of extremists yeah. on both sides of the issue, yeah. both sides, yeah. extremism. Mm-hmm. And what happens to the mucky middle? 
it gets bashed on both sides, which is not fun. So I, I was going to ask you ask you the other question, but I, I feel like we've already covered All right, that. what is the other question? Well, then we'll wrap okay. it up. Okay, okay. Well, um, I was. Would you would you be happy with taking um, some short questions from my following right now? Instagram, yeah. All right, let's do it. Cool. I didn't know you had some questions from followers. Sorry. It's okay. Apologies. I, okay. I should have made that more clear. I didn't know that you had had that. Okay. So what what are some of the uh, Instagram questions? So we have one from Gem Will. 78 who says who asks you uh, if you could write a letter to your younger self what would it say i could write a letter about to myself yeah to yourself if you could send it in a time machine and write a letter to your younger self well, there's a lot of things that my lot of mistakes <laughs> my younger self made and if some of the um information that um I got into trouble at work because when I was young, because I didn't recognize the warning signs that a new boss didn't like me. Sure. I'll give you an example. I was working for the Arizona Farmer Ranchman, livestock editor, cranking out the articles every month. We got a new boss. He didn't like me. I didn't recognize those warning signs. But Susie, who did the graphic design and set up the ads, she, I'm pretty sure, was on the spectrum. She says, Jim doesn't like you. We're going to have to make a portfolio of all your articles. And then I got a raise. Sure. But if I had, if she, but I wouldn't have recognized those warning signs. Mm -hmm. Well, that wouldn't have happened. Sure. Um, a other thing that I didn't understand when I first started is how ego and emotion can affect decisions mm -hmm. that would actually cause gigantic problems in the work uh, with equipment. Mm -hmm. I have a concept called project oil. Well, I learned that um, there were there were managers where it was it was their ego. Yeah. It didn't matter whether it would work or not. That was a very hard thing for me to learn. That um, uh, one guy didn't like because I was a girl. He actually sabotaged some equipment. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I've been going. I mean, it cost thousands of dollars worth of downtime. Oh, my God. This is the kind of stuff that was um, really hard for me to. Um, now I'm realizing that humans can be extremely irrational. Yeah. But there's a lot of things that. Um, I know now. They'd want to, um, to tell you. I found, as I said before, I found the reading some of the most valuable stuff for me was reading the lived in experiences. Mm -hmm. And there were just a few when I got started. Donna Williams's stuff. There was someone named Tony W. Had a short article. I read the uh, about Jesse Parks. Mm -hmm. But I found then later on, lived in experiences were were um, really important for me to learn. The highlighting lived experiences. Yeah. And, but also I'm realizing that the way I was brought up where social manners were taught in a much more structured way, it's really helpful. And it's also the reason why a lot of the, uh, okay, socially awkward, no speech delay or Asperger types sure. of my generation got good jobs and kept them. Mm -hmm. But their marriages were probably had a lot of problems. So we've got a what's the next question? Another question, which is from Harp Harpen AU. Um, <laughs> how hard was it for you to find and keep a job? I'm having real trouble with that. Well, one of the first jobs I got was the writing for the Farm Arrangement magazine. And one thing I was good at was finding the back door to jobs. Yeah. And I went up and I got the editor's card, as it's shown in the movie. And I almost lost the job and I just explained it in the previous question, but I was pretty good at, at keeping jobs because I was on time. I don't, I've, there's a lot of individuals that lose a job because they're on time. So sure. just mouth back. Yeah. That's a problem I didn't have. I got my articles in on time. Yeah. And, and I, and, and then once I presented a portfolio, I kept that job, but I wouldn't have gotten fired from a job for being late. You see, Sorry. this is where 50s upbringing did help. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got one more last question. Um, what do you think about the crossover between autism, mental health, and childhood trauma? Uh, that's oh, there definitely Marla is crossover. Carries. Oh, there definitely is crossover. And childhood trauma upregulates the fear circuits in the brain. 
you know, when little kids get treated badly, it is really bad. Yeah, there definitely is crossover. The other thing that helps me is I do vigorous exercise every day, hundred nice. sit-ups every day. Nice. And I find this burst of vigorous exercise uh, does some things that just walking a long distance doesn't. Okay, I can do a really long airport walk. Yeah. And that just doesn't do the same thing as a very, you know, two and a half minutes of very, very vigorous burst of hard exercise. Now, it took me three months to get up to that hundred. Mm-hmm. But I find I have trouble sleeping if I don't do that. That's something that's been real helpful and it's easy to do. You know, that that's really strange you say that because that's I, I used to do um leg raises. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be day, the same thing. Push ups and squats. Well, you see, and it doesn't take long to do it. Yeah. And you do it just long enough to start to sweat. Yeah. And there's something different that that does that a mile long walk out of the airport doesn't do. Now, both are good things to do, but they have a different, but the vigorous exercise helps with sleep. Yeah, I would, I would attest to that. I, I go to the gym about five, five times a week. Okay. Well, that's, that's the same thing. I travel to, I, I just do it in the room, but I um, have something that's simple to do, mm-hmm. but that was very, very helpful to me. And i um, no, I want to see individuals on the spectrum get out and be successful. The other thing is we got to find more back doors to jobs. Yeah. See that scene in the movie where I got the editor's card. It's a very important scene sure. because that's back door. Then I produced a good article. Mm-hmm. And then everything was fine until we got a new boss and I didn't recognize the warning signs. Thank you, Susie, who was also probably autistic, who did the laid out the ads. She says, Jim doesn't like you. We're going to have to get a big scrapbook together of every article you've written. Yeah. That saved my job. See, that's showing the work. What I want to ask you is, what do you think? I know it's it might be a difficult question, but um, what do you really want people to take away from our talk, our podcast? Well, I want individuals on the spectrum to get out and be what they can do. And what I see happening... <clears throat> is um, you know, fully verbal people like me. Let's go play video games in the basement yeah. or get out and have a life. Now, if those video gamers were going into great careers, I would not be criticizing it. Sure. Now, my kind of mind is the one that tends to get addicted to video games. Me There's too. been some success <laughs> with um, um, the gamers getting switched over to auto mechanics and yeah. actually going to a career in that. And you have to do it slowly. Yeah. Because the cars were more interesting than the video games. Sure. Um, but you've got to get parents, you've got to get the kid out doing stuff. Now, I'll tell you something you don't do. First job, shove an 18-year-old girl in this chaotic clothing store at Christmas time. That you don't do. That was a failure. Too much multitasking. Yeah, we do have to be careful about the multitasking. But I worked with so many people that I know were undiagnosed on the spectrum interesting careers Mm -hmm. and it gave their life meaning meaning i love that well thank thank you very much for that um okay well i guess we've been almost two hours are you going to play the whole (laughs) two hours of this are you going to edit it what are you going to do with this i'm just gonna i'm gonna edit it slightly and i'm gonna release it um well some of the stuff talking about microphones we can probably definitely edit that (laughs) yeah um so um usually with this this um this new season so this is the second season of my podcast um i try to incorporate a song so some some music um do you have do you have a particular song um that you would like to share with our listeners oh so was a song i really it? liked was we'll never walk alone out of carousel I'll never walk alone. When you walk through a storm, you know, that sort of like, like, that was my favorite song in high school. Thank you for that. So if you have enjoyed our chat and you want to to get, to go see more of the kind of stuff that I do, uh, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, all at Asperger's Growth. And if you want to find the podcast anywhere else, 
You can find it on pretty much all podcasting platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google, all of that good stuff. And if you want to get in contact with me to to hire me as a speaker or to hire me to be a part of a panel or do some modeling work, you can find all of that information on my website, thomashenley.co.uk. Today, I want to to highlight um, another person for our community as a profile of the day. Um, if I can just search them up, where are they? Apologies, Temple. I want to highlight the autistic poet, Russell Lehman. Um, he does a lot of work around poetry and he, he does a lot of good work in in public speaking. Um, and I definitely go, go over and check his stuff out. He does have some uh, views that, that maybe a lot of people don't like, um, but he, he, he did just definitely express himself as an individual and um, I'm, I'm, you know, very happy to 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 have him come on my podcast later later on. So yes, uh, thank you to all our YouTube members and uh, Patreon supporters. Um, and uh, yeah, you know your guy, your guys' support for this, especially Mr. Patrick Vedi, has been absolutely amazing. So I can continue doing this alongside my full time job. Um, all really great support. Um, massive thanks to you guys um, and Temple thank you thank you so much for coming on to speak to me it really does absolutely mean the world to me and I'm sure that thank a lot you. of people thank you for having me and I just want to help people you know get out there and you know be everything that they can be cool well have you enjoyed your experience on the, yes on I the have no, I've had a, had a good experience and and i you know, I want to see, you know, the younger people. I'm way past retirement age, but I still am working. I get out and have an interesting life, and maybe I've given given them you some ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Temple. See you later, guys. Oh my God, it's blowing up. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did not see you there. So, <laughs> thank you very much for watching this very, very long episode and sticking by even past the point at which people go, oh, the video's over and then click off. Because you know there is another special part that you can divulge yourself in. I just wanted to take this time just to address some things that you know are related to the podcast and we all know that I've taken absolutely forever to come up with another episode and and edit it and release it and there's been there's been a lot of stuff going on um in my life both mental health wise life related things and also um my Instagram and my YouTube channel I've I've really been trying a lot very lately to try and build myself up in, in different areas within training and public speaking and all that. Uh, so I'm, I'm really just do, doing a bit of ramble and, you know, just wanted to um, say thanks for, for sticking around. Not not only to the end of this video, but also um, just in general on the, on the Asperger's Growth YouTube channel, on the podcast streaming service that you use. Um, I just want to say thank you, and um, you know this is, is this has been an absolutely amazing episode. I was going to I had some grand plans to do this. I was going to uh, create like a whole animation to go as the backdrop, and I was gonna sort of <laughs> mix around with the introduction and make it a bit more clean, and you know use my new microphone and all that. Oh, there it is. <laughs> So I had a lot of plans and, you know, as, as with everything, you know, a lot of steps um, that you give yourself to do in order to do something requires a lot more time than you would expect. Hence why I've been so lackluster in getting these episodes out. <laughs> I was going to put something at the, at the start of the video, um, but I just thought that it'd be a bit more... Uh, personal, um, I could sort of 
ramble unedited um, you know, for, for the first time in a while. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate you and the fact that you've stuck around and you've followed my work and you've supported me despite all the um, controversial stuff that I've been involved in, mostly about my name, which will be changed very soon. Not because it's got Asperger's in it, but because I don't like it. I don't like the, the name Asperger's Grove, so I'm changing it. I'm flipping it around and doing all that stuff with it. Not really sure what, what I'm going to call myself yet. As I said, a lot of steps. I'm talking to a very, very lovely woman called the Social Orty, um, who is helping me and sort of do a rebrand and like change my name and you know do all that kind of stuff so there will be something like that coming along at some point and I'm pretty excited for it I'm not gonna lie you know re recent stuff that's happened is um you know it's, I've, I've had some really really big stuff that's that's happened below behind below the scenes behind the scenes of my youtube channel and my podcast particularly around instagram um, I've, I've been posting lots of updates and you know, things of that nature. I know that, that it's not always perfect, the transfer of YouTube and podcasts to social media. So I know that I'm not uh, not the majority of you will know that I've been continuing to post to Instagram and you know things of that nature. But um, yeah, really struggling to, to know what to say. Um, I've kind of built this this episode release this season two release up for such a long time that I just you know jumping back in for for my first episode with such a big name in the autism industry I felt kind of out of my depth um but it's, it was great it was a really great episode and there is mu there is much more to come I have been working behind the scenes once again to record and you know, chat to some, some other really interesting, cool guests, uh, which will be coming out. As far as schedules for releasing the podcast episodes, honestly, I bought this chair. And it was supposed to be a replacement to my very creaky other chair, but it still seems to have a similar problem. Chairs don't like my fat ass, sadly. I wouldn't say fat, but, you know, it's, it's weighty. It's weighty. So what was I saying? I was saying a lot of stuff. I guess, you know, what I want to, to leave you on is uh, never feel like you cannot reach out. I know that sometimes it can feel a bit um, disillusioning to, to watch and listen to some, some people talk to each other or listen to me talking to a camera, which I'm trying to imagine that's you. Um, but I am a real person, and you know, I want to maintain that. And I always really appreciate emails, and messages, and, you know, it's, it's really kept me going, kept me wanting to start the podcast up again. It's a, it's a really big project. <laughs> it requires a lot of different things, a lot of time. A lot of money, well not a lot of money, but a, a significant portion of money. It's not the main issue, mostly the time. And um, the thing is I really love doing it and I wish I could do more of them and get them out quicker and, you know, get them edited and put out there and, you know, just, just me speaking and to other people or speaking to a camera and then it's it's gone into the, the internet ether and it's um, it's all distributed everywhere. That would be the ideal. That's not how it goes. <laughs> not for a for a small creator like myself. Um. So yeah. And also, don't ne never feel like you can't reach out. There is a lovely community of autistic people on Instagram. Some of them are assholes, of course. And they're very nitpicky about the type of words that you use. But overall, a lovely community to be a part of if you just know some of the social rules. 
if you are, if you are listening to this and you, you find yourself in a isolated position and you, you don't really know where to go in life, I would really recommend going on to Instagram and not only following me, but following some of the amazing people that I follow. Um, they really did a lot to, to bring me up, especially when I was alone and isolated in my university days. Um, so that should happen. I, I don't know why I'm assuming that you're lonely and isolated, but for the, for the people who are out there who are, um, you know, there is always space, there is always time to grow and time to fix your situation and opportunities and you know great life experiences it does require a lot of effort and it is very scary but you can do it and um you know i <laughs> I'm just going to leave this as like a whole video and just attach it to the end. Um, this is not going to be on the actual podcast episode, but it's going to be on mine, on the, the video version. So um, just for you guys on YouTube. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I won't keep you much longer as you're probably very socially overloaded from people speaking to each other about sometimes quite intense and emotional topics. And there I go again, I'm talking. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. As always, I love you guys. You're great. And uh, I hope that you're okay and I hope that you're doing good. And reach out if you need to. Bloody chair. <laughs> See you later, folks. Hey, now I can put my dressing gown on. Just a little bit of a insider information. I actually... I find it really difficult to sleep and wind down with my dressing gown. It's like sort of a mental cue. I think it's something about you know, just having a soft fabric on, on my arms. You, know, you don't really get that during the day unless you wear a hoodie. And even then, I'm, it's usually a bit too hot. So this is my autistic comfort thing. Some people have plushies, some people have blankets. I wear a dressing gown. There you go. See you later, guys. <laughs> oh, I am so sleep deprived. <laughs> Goodbye. Yes, it's the end now. It's good. Thomas cut it before. <laughs>